We're, again, we're doing 1A and 1A together because this is rational functions with zeros and vertical asymptotes. All right, so we're continuing with rational functions, except now we're finding the zeros, and then we're going to find the vertical asymptotes. So the zeros of my rational function come from setting the, the numerator equal to zero. That's it. You ignored the bottom because if I set the whole thing equal to zero, I would multiply by the bottom. The bottom would cancel out. So I only worry about the numerator. You will list these zeros like x equals this number, this number, and this number. Okay. A number can occur more than once. And just like before, if the multiplicity was 2, it will impact your graph the same way. So if I get a 2 that occurs twice, my graph is actually going to bounce off that just like it would. And that's what creates those like parabola shapes. The vertical asymptotes come from your denominator. So the vertical asymptote occurs where your domain is restricted. So on domain, we say it can't equal that value. Your vertical asymptote is that it does equal that value because your vertical asymptote is where your denominator is undefined. You are going to factor denominators. You're also going to have ones that aren't factorable. You're going to have ones that don't exist. And you would just say no vertical asymptotes. These are vertical lines, so they have to be in the format of x equals. If you don't put an x equals on these, you will get docked points. So on the graphs of our functions, if we had horizontal asymptotes, they are horizontal lines, obviously, something like this. A vertical asymptote would either be one vertical asymptote. There could be two vertical asymptotes. There could be three vertical asymptotes. And your graph cannot cross through these. So it's not like the horizontal asymptote where in the middle it can kind of cross through. They cannot touch these vertical asymptotes. It would literally be undefined there. So would that, would that affect your end behavior? Not your end behavior, the middle behavior. Okay. Yeah. So the horizontal asymptote is what affects your end behavior. The vertical asymptote is going to affect, like you'll see it. We're going to write the vertical asymptotes with limit notation. Okay. Yeah. No, there, it's either one is bigger than the other or they are the same or like there's no double. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so it says find the domain, the zeros, and the vertical asymptotes of the rational function. So we're going to do all three things. We'll start with A. How do I find domain? Denominator does not equal zero. X would not equal five. So my domain is from negative infinity to five and five to positive infinity. My vertical asymptote is literally just the opposite of that. It's x equals five. And the horizontal asymptote, what's the relationship of the coefficient, and, I mean, of the degree in the top and the bottom? They're the same, which means, this is my leading coefficients, right? Leading coefficient in the numerator is one, leading coefficient in the bottom is one. So it would be one over one or just one. Go to B. So I'm going to factor my denominator. Oh, wait, did I do zeros? No, I didn't. I did horizontal asymptote instead of zeros. Sorry. Zeros come from my numerator. So my 0 is x equals negative 4. Okay, now B. So now I'm going to factor both the numerator and the denominator. The numerator to get the 0, the denominator to get the domain, and the vertical asymptotes. So my numerator is the difference of two squares. My denominator is x minus 5 and x plus 1. So the zeros from my, from my numerator are x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 1. You guys got to stop the chatting. The denominator is my domain x cannot equal 5, and x cannot equal negative 1. So my domain 
is negative infinity to negative 1, negative 1 to 5, and 5 to 1. I mean, 5 to positive infinity. And my vertical asymptotes are the opposite of this, x equals 5 and x equals negative 1. It didn't ask for it, but what would your horizontal asymptote be? Y equals 1 again. Questions? All right, go to C. So I can factor the numerator. I can take out an x this time. Can you factor the denominator? No. So if I want to find the domain, I would set this not equal to zero. I'd get x squared cannot equal negative five, and I'd get x equals plus and minus the square root of negative five. Does that exist? No. no. So there is no domain restriction. Domain would be all real numbers, which means there would be no vertical asymptotes. And then the zeros from the numerator, x equals 0 and x equals 4. What's your horizontal asymptote? y equals 1. Still good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, now look at D. Now we're going to read it from a graph, okay? So again, most of the time, some of the times these images actually will have your little lines drawn, but most of the times you won't see them. And on your graphing utility, you will not see them. So you've got to kind of learn where they go. So in both of those breaks, moving left to right, I'd have a vertical asymptote. So it appears as though one is at negative five and one is at positive two. Sure, it doesn't matter. Or you can sit over here. It doesn't matter. So there is one and there's the other, okay? So because there's a break in the graph that way, how would it impact my domain? Negative infinity to negative five. Negative five to two. And two to positive infinity, good. That's also where your vertical asymptotes are. X would equal negative five and X would equal positive two. And where are the zeros on this graph? Just negative two. Is there a horizontal asymptote? Where? Y equals zero. Yep, you see it's affecting the end behavior. That's how you'd know. Yeah, because there's a graph there. So there are points graphed there. Domain only stops and starts with the vertical asymptotes or with holes, which we'll get to tomorrow. But yeah. Sure. Oh, like the whole side. All right. So now we're going to use all of that, to be honest. All of that was algebra two. Okay. We did all of that. So hopefully that seemed a little familiar. Now we're going to use limit notation to talk about these vertical asymptotes. So this limit notation, notice it's in. Those, there's two boxes because there are two vertical asymptotes. So for every vertical asymptote, you have to do left and right. And the way you do left and right is this little symbol here, the minus and the plus. And how that's read is as x is approaching negative 5 from the left or as negative 5 is approaching negative 5 from the right. So for every vertical asymptote, you have to have one with the minus and one with the plus after it. Okay? Yep. So instead of going like away from... Correct. Now we're coming towards the asymptote from both sides. So this is basically saying we already established that we had a vertical asymptote at 5 or negative 5. It's here. So if it's saying from the left, we're saying literally come in from the left. So as I come in from the left here and I get closer to negative 5, what's happening to my y values? They're going to keep going down without bound, which means that limit is negative, negative infinity.
Now the positive says come into negative five, but from the right hand side. So I'm coming up here. What's happening to my y values as I'm getting closer to negative five from the right? It's increasing without bound, which means infinity. Still good? Now you're going to repeat that whole process for the other vertical. And oh, that should really be a two. I screenshot the wrong question here. This should be a two. Not that it really matters, but okay. Positive two. Yeah, I screenshot the wrong question. Sorry, guys. I did not want to have to rewrite that in PowerPoint. It's a pain in the butt. All right. So as you're approaching positive two from the left, which means I'm coming at it from this direction. What's happening with my Y values? Decreasing without bound, which means negative infinity. And as it's approaching positive two from the right hand side, what's happening? Increase, raise going up, increasing without bound. So positive infinity. Yep. No, I just started moving towards the right. You could literally start at the top and keep going towards the right. You're still going to end up moving towards the right. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome. Questions? Yes. Never mind. Okay. All right. You do this one. Find the vertical asymptote and then use the limit notation to show what's happening with your graph. So as I'm... I'm going to start with the negative 5, right? So I drew the vertical asymptote awesome th th through negative 5. Shh. you got to do negative 5 from the left and negative 5 from the right. So as I'm coming from the left, so I'm going to the left of negative 5 and I'm moving towards it. So as I move towards this, I want to know what's happening with that y. It's going to keep getting bigger, which means it's approaching infinity. So the limit there is infinity, okay? That would be infinity. Then I want to know as it's coming from the right. So as I'm coming from the right side of my vertical asymptote, but I want to get closer to it. So I'm coming from the right, but I'm going towards the left, technically. I want to know what's happening here. And it, the arrow is pointing down, so it's going to go towards negative infinity. Then I want to do the same thing on the right. So I'm going to 4. But the first one is negative. We're 4 from the left. So as I'm coming from the left, so here... What's happening with these y values? They're getting smaller without bound, which means this would be negative infinity. And then as I'm coming from the right, I'm coming from the right, but towards my vertical asymptote, that y is going to positive infinity. Does that make sense? You're going to write this limit notation on your quiz. It's not given to you. So make sure you learn to start to write it. Yeah. Does it matter if we did like the, like the four instead of negative five first? No, it doesn't matter as long as you got both. And it doesn't matter if you do negative over positive, positive. It, like, it doesn't matter as long as they're all four there. This is limit notation of the vertical asymptote. And then what's the other limit that we should use for? The, the end behavior. Yeah. Yeah, no, they're two completely different things. So, like, if we have a vertical asymptote, we wouldn't use the end behavior. Correct. Correct. But a question, and I do have it right now, like it's a big chunk of a question, has multiple parts, could ask for both end behavior and vertical asymptotes using limit notation. So those are the two different things. So end behavior here is it goes to negative infinity. It's going to negative infinity. Yeah. And, and if it goes to positive infinity, it's going to positive infinity. You'd have to plug, does that make, no, 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 it goes to zero. It's going to zero and going to zero. Yeah, it's going based on your horizontal asymptote. Yeah. Would that have asymptote? Yeah. At, at zero. Yep. Well, it appears, no, no, actually, it appears to be, at, it could be at one. It's not at zero, probably. But you would see it. Yeah. Because it's higher, it is probably at one. Would there be like a losing mark down in line, like a college board, or like, um, I don't remember the college board questions if they are marked or if they are not. If I if it is not clear, I will make sure it, it is a line. Correct. It would be a, da a dash line. Yeah. Dash line.
All right, so complete the table, find the vertical asymptote using an equation and limit notation. So obviously, if you have your equation, it should be easy to identify your vertical asymptote, okay? But you want to also understand what it would look like in value format, because what if they didn't give you the equation and they gave you a table full of values, okay? So if I just look at the equation, where is my vertical asymptote? X equals negative 3, okay? Again, I also have to know if this table was given to me as full values, I would have to spot it from the, from the, the values, okay? So I'm going to put this equation in my y equals so I don't have to keep writing it out. And then I'm going to do y1 of negative 2.9 to negative 2.99, negative 2.999, negative 3 all the way through. Now, what happens when you get to negative 3? You get an error message, right? Why are you getting an error message? Because that's where my vertical asymptote is. So, the, your calculator will literally tell you, okay, and it looks like this. It literally says, error, you're dividing by 0. Attempted calculation contains division by 0. Calculation fails, okay? But that means it's undefined at that point. Then keep going 3.001 or negative 3.001, negative 4,006.001, negative 3.01, negative 406.1, and, or sorry, 0 0.01, and negative 3.1, negative 46.1. So again, make sure that you knew if they, like instead of them giving you the equation, if they gave you this chart, that undefined spot means there's a vertical asymptote, okay? So it would be important to understand it from the chart as well, a completed chart. All right, now we have to talk about, so we did the equation, we did the equation for the vertical asymptote. Now we gotta talk about the limit notation. So we're saying what's the limit of my graph as X approaches negative three from the left and what's the limit of my graph as X approaches negative three from the right. Now this is where it gets a little tricky. What values are on the left and what values are on the right? The left. Is it the left of the graph? I mean the left of the table and the right of the table? No, it switched this time. So be careful, make sure you understand that it doesn't always go left, right. These values are actually bigger than these values, right? So as my number line would look, like if I actually looked on a number line, I'd have negative 3. To the right of negative 3 is actually my negative 2.99. Then my negative 2.99. Then my, I should have drawn it bigger, negative 2.9. So my vertical, awesome, my vertical axis wouldn't be there. Hang on. It would be all the way over here. And then to the right of it, closest to negative 3 is negative 3.001. Then it would be negative 3.01. And then it would be negative 3.1. So as I'm moving from the left, means I'm actually looking at these table of values on this side. I still want to move into negative 3 because that's how I'm getting closer to negative 3. But what's happening to these x or the y values as I move closer? They're going down, and again, it would be without bound, which means they're approaching where? Negative, negative infinity. So the limit is negative infinity. And then of the other side, as I'm approaching from the right, this actually means these 2.99 values, and as I'm getting closer to negative 3, what's happening to those values? They're increasing, again, without bound, which means f of x, the limit would be positive infinity. Okay, so this is tricky because they switch the sides. Always check to make sure what's bigger, what's smaller. The bigger is going to go on the right of it. The smaller is going to go on the left of it. All right, slant asymptote. The slant asymptote, okay, is the third kind of asymptote. So we did horizontal, we did vertical, and now we're going to do slant. A slant asymptote occurs... If the degree of the numerator is exactly one more than the degree of the numerator. 
No more, no less. So it has to be one more. It can't be two more. It can't be three more, okay? It has to be one more. If it's more than that, there's neither horizontal or slant. Yep. For exponents, no, these will be whole numbers, positive whole numbers even. Okay. So the way, once you establish that it is a slant asymptote, so if the highest exponent in the top is 3 and the highest exponent in the bottom is 2, slant asymptote. To the fourth, x to the third, slant asymptote. x squared over x, slant asymptote. All one more, okay? Once you establish that there is a slant asymptote, the way you find it is by dividing the numerator by the denominator. You sometimes can do synthetic. I mean, yeah, so if it was just x to the first, you can do synthetic. If it's not, you have to do long division, okay, which we're going to review that stuff. And if that's the case and you divide, whatever the quotient is, so whatever the part without the remainder is the equation of your slant asymptote. If you do this correctly, when you divide, your answer will always be linear. It's always going to be x to the first power plus or minus a number. And y equals that is your line, and that line is your slant asymptote. All right, so if you look at A, exponent in the top is 2, exponent in the bottom is 1. There is a slant asymptote here. So now we divide. If I want to divide the numerator by the bottom, because this is an x to the first in the bottom, I can actually use synthetic division here. So this would be plus 0. And I would do 1, negative 4, 0. Draw yourself your little box. The opposite of what follows x goes on the outside. Negative 5 goes on the outside. I bring down the 1. I multiply by negative 5 and put it in the next column. I add it. I would normally multiply by negative 5 and put it in the next column, but this, not, this remainder does not matter, God bless you, when it comes, God bless you, to your slant asymptote. This is your slant asymptote. Y equals X minus 9. Again, it has to be linear. If it's not, then your X1 on the top is more than just 1, which means there's no slant asymptote. Valeska. Um, why did you use the so because I can, and it's faster. So when you're just, when you have X to the first that you're dividing by, you can use synthetic. The next one we won't. I'm going to review long division too, because the next one you can't. So if it's in the bottom with the higher X1, you can't. You can't use synthetic. Yep, if and your you divisor has something X bigger than one, x to the power of something bigger than one, you can't use synthetic. Can you remember why you discarded like the 40? It literally just is not part of your, okay. of your slant asymptote. I'm sure somebody proved why at some point. I don't know why I just listened to them. Okay. Yeah. Claire. How did you get the one and the zero? The coefficients on your divisor. You're welcome. And remember, if you're missing a term, you plug in the zero as the placeholder. So if it was x squared minus 4, I would do 1, 0, negative 4. So wherever there's a term missing, I put a 0. Yep. Why is it like x minus 9? Why don't we put the x on the first one? Because the last one would be the remainder. Mm -hmm. The next one is the constant. Mm -hmm. The next one would be x to the first. If there was another, it would be x squared and so on and so forth. Yep. You're reducing it at a degree by dividing by a factor. So we went from x squared down a degree, which means it should be linear. Every time you find a factor, it will always be. Well, the, the slope isn't always 1, but x will always be to the first. Yeah. Yep. All right, we're going to do b, and b, we're going to do long division, okay? So this time, the 1 in the numerator is 1 more than the 1 in the denominator, but I cannot use synthetic with an x squared. So we do the numerator, which is missing an x term, so I'm plug plugging in a 0x. Again, you have to have a placeholder. You have to have one term for each term that's there. So I'm going to rewrite it out, 2x to the third minus 3x squared plus 0x plus 4 divided by x squared minus 4x minus 5. And then I do first into first. Yeah. So when it, x is a power greater than 1? You can't use synthetic. You have to use long division. You can use long division all the time. So if you don't remember how to do the synthetic, you could do this every time. But obviously, synthetic is easier, usually. So I would say you would choose that if it was an x to the first power that you're dividing by. 
But if not, you have to use long division. So I want to divide first into first. What would I have to multiply x squared by to get to 2x to the third? 2x. And then it gets multiplied by all three terms. So first term is 2x to the third. Second term, term is negative 8x. Third term is negative 10x. Negative 8x squared. Good job. I was just making sure you're paying attention. All right, now I can. I have two choices here. The language is either subtract them or change your signs and add. So when I teach it, I teach you to change your signs and add because people make stupid mistakes when they subtract negatives, and they're both the same thing. So if I change my signs here and I add, and you do it correctly, the first term should cancel out. The second term is a 5x squared. The third term is a positive 10x. And then I bring down the 4. And I repeat that whole process. So what would I have to multiply the first term on the outside to get to the first term of our new dividend? 5. Positive 5. So I multiply all three terms of positive 5. 5 times x squared, 5x squared. 5 times negative 4x, negative 20x. 5 times negative 5, negative 25. And we change our signs. <coughs> The first one cancels out. 10x plus 20x is 30x plus 29. But this is my remainder. Does it even matter? No. What I need comes from, my numer from the top here. So y equals 2x plus 5 is your slant asymptote. If you know you need to review synthetic and long division, I'll put, like, at the top of the module, I'll put a prereq to a page. I'll put some links there, okay? But obviously, that's an Algebra 2 skill that they assume you already have in your back pocket. Yeah. Why, how do you know that 30x plus 29 is Because, so the remainder happens when you're dividing, when the exponent on the bottom is less than the exponent on the outside. I'd have to multiply this by a negative exponent for that to happen, which we don't do. You also only want two terms at the top. That's another hint because you want it to be linear. Okay. Questions? Yeah. So it would always be like um, coefficient x and then the constant? Yep. Always like that? Yeah, and the constant might be zero, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, last slide. This is called a sign table. So the... Graph is going to be given to you, okay? And then it's going to give you a range. And what it wants is, is it increasing, decreasing, or undefined? So as I look at the graph on the left, the first one is from negative infinity to negative 5. Actually, wait. Sorry. It's positive, negative. So you're looking at the y values. Are the y values positive, are they negative, or are they undefined? So if I look at from negative infinity to 5, I'm looking at this term here, okay, or that little part of my graph there. Are those, X, are those Y values positive, negative? They're negative because they're below the X axis. You write negative, yeah. What happens at negative 5? It's 0. What happens from negative 5 to negative 2? They're positive. What happens at negative 2? Undefined. UD. What happens from negative 2 to 5? Negative. What happens at 5? Zero. And what happens from five to positive infinity? Positive. So it will ask you to fill this chart out. It will also ask you to read a chart that looks like this to know what's happening with your graph. So you have to know those zeros mean it's crossing the axis at that point. You have to know the, the undefined means there's a vertical asymptote. Okay, so you're kind of going to read these both ways. Rodrigo. The sign is literally the sign. And then when, when there's like a vertical asymptote, it's all against the line. Correct. That's what I'm Yep.
It would be the same. We'll get to holes, but it would be the so same for the holes. Like what happens at x equals negative, negative 2 there? Yeah. If there's a vertical asymptote there, yeah. A hole is a, literally a hole on your graph. Wait, my